Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Silver Liming. I'm your host, Anne Desjardins, and I love doing these podcasts and sharing these stories of others getting better from Lyme and tick-borne illness because hopefully it gives you some hope and insight into ways that you could potentially help to heal your own body if you are somebody struggling with Lyme and tick-borne illness. For those of us who have gone through this, we know that this is one of the hardest things, maybe if not the hardest thing that you might ever have to experience in your life. And there are a lot of dark spaces and places that you can fall off and get trapped and stuck. And so again, I really wanted to share other stories of getting better and recovery like my own that will hopefully again, inspire you if you are looking for such a thing as inspiration. But today I have a really wonderful guest and I know she's also come through a lot and is now giving back and helping others in um, their own journeys of recovering from Lyme and tick-borne illness. But Heather Gray, she is a functional practitioner and um, actually she's an FDMP and I'll let her talk a little bit more about the exact specifications of what that entails. But Heather, thank you again for coming on today. I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to share your story here on my podcast, The Silver Liming. So if you don't mind, if you would just share a little bit more about who you are and how you became involved with Lyme and tick-borne illness, please. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And pronounce your last name for me again. Yes, it's Desjardins. That's beautiful. What is it? Thanks. Thanks. French. 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 Okay. Of the garden. I was like, ooh, Desjardins. What is that? It sounds fancy. Right. Like, <laughs> what do they say? Desjardins. I'm like, no, I'm not mustard, people. <laughs> I was lucky when I remarried as gray because Heather Gray, that's actually a color. Yeah. You know, uh, my, yeah. My, my previous um, last name was Johnson, which is like three-fourths of the world's population and also synonymous with a male body part. So I definitely moved up in the world when I married a gray. So uh, I'm, I like last names. Anywho, yes. So I am uh, also, aka, the Lime Boss. And I started my journey. I tell people, I always start the story the same way as I was basically born full of shit, right? Like how many people, you know, right. Can relate to being constipated at a very, very, very young age. I was four years old, right. Sitting on the potty for so long that my feet would fall asleep. Aww. And this was like my first intro into let's throw band-aids at symptoms, right. The doctors would just throw nasty thick oils down my throat or give me stool softeners, but nobody was trying to figure out why this four-year-old was so constipated. Hindsight's 2020. That's the same year my uncle committed suicide. Aww. And I think that clip that, um, triggered my autoimmune disease of celiac. And I was eating a very standard American sad diet at the time. So it was, you know, kind of a perfect combination, perfect storm. So fast forward many, many more years, a lot of early childhood trauma. I was raised by addicts, a lot of toxins. I'm pretty sure I was living in a moldy home. Um, you know, uh, leaky gut now because I've got celiac and it's being bombarded by the crappy diet that I'm eating. And so when I did get bit by a tick, when I was 13 years old, I had, I was the perfect, the perfect host, right? Like it was the perfect storm. And that started with two years later where, when my symptoms started, I didn't get a bullseye rash. Like everybody thinks that you do only 30% of the population actually gets that bullseye rash. So there was no bullseye rash. And my first couple symptoms started about two years later when I ended up in the psych ward for the first time with my own suicide attempts. Um, it was a lot of brain inflammation. It was a lot of uh, gut. You know, Lyme is notorious for picking out the weak spots already and, you know, exacerbating them. So I already had an issue with the gut. We already know I've got like a history of mental you know, illness in my family. So, you know, attack the gut and the brain, one, two punch. You know, of course, then again, I'm 15 years old and in the psych ward. Are they trying to figure out why I'm in the psych ward? Nope. They're, you know, calling me attention seeking. They're every antipsychotic, antidepressant, mood stabilizer, which none of them worked, you know, patted me on the head and sent me out the door. And I had quite a few more of those moments throughout my life. I remember, God, at one point I was thinking about suicide 10 to 15 times a day. And it's not uncommon for people with Lyme disease because your brain is so inflamed. I'm actually going to, I want to, I've been wanting to start this movement of stop calling people crazy. Instead say your brain inflammation is showing, right? Yes. Because I was not crazy, but the louder you scream that, the more they go, well, that's what a crazy person would say. And you can, once you get slapped with that stigma of being mentally unstable, it is really, really hard to come back from that. 
So, you know, once my inflammation went down, my body and my brain could then work properly. I'm not inherently, you know, you know, insane. Yes. I'm just, my brain was inflamed, right? I had a bunch of um, critters going on in my brain. I have a little bit of a sinus thing going on right now. So I apologize. Um, but yeah, so that was the first part of my, my story. I basically went 27 years undiagnosed. Um, like I said, multiple suicide attempts, multiple uh, uh, chronic migrating pain, you know, not sleeping. Then I ended up developing three autoimmune diseases. I was 120 pounds overweight at one time. Wow. I had cavitations. I had mold toxicity, heavy metals, parasites, other bacteria. So a lot of the things that most of us with Lyme get, most people don't realize that Lyme is never by itself. It usually never comes. It's never just Lyme. It's usually co-infections like Bartonella, Babesia, other things along with Candida and mold and you know, crappy detox genes. And so it's this whole chemical, you know, this, I mean, just, just crap storm of stuff that you kind of have to start teasing out. And so after I got my diagnosis, it was hilarious. I had probably gone to 50 different doctors in my lifetime. And, uh, I was in another dark, dark time and I, my kid was nine. And um, my girlfriend, who was a psychologist, said, why don't you go see this doctor in Denver? I've heard that they do amazing things. And I was like, whatever. At this point, I was I was low again. And so I, I you know, I needed a, a lifeline. So I drive to Denver, which is about 50 miles away. And this woman with this beautiful accent, I can't remember where she was from, literally in her office for five minutes. And she gets this twinkle in her eye and she goes, I know exactly what's wrong with you. And I'm thinking, bullshit. And she goes, have you ever been bitten by a tick? And I was like, yes. When I was 13, I was living in Missouri and we pulled it out of my stomach. And she goes, I think you have Lyme disease. And of course, you know, a lot of us that, you know, didn't have answers for so long. We think that that's our golden ticket, right? Like I've got a golden ticket. Really? <laughs> it's just the beginning yeah. of a whole yeah. other. Yeah. Sure, the golden right? ticket to an entrance to a ride you really never wanted to go on. Exactly. Oh my gosh. I mean, when the CDC just recognizes that the disease that I've had my whole freaking life is just now recognized this month by the CDC, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was an interesting time because I remember going home. Well, first off, I remember driving down the highway, you know, 75 miles an hour, tears streaming down my face. And I screamed, I told you I'm not crazy. And that's going to be the name of my book when I finally get it out is I told you I'm not crazy, the realities of Lyme disease. But, um, but I'm I'm down the highway and I get home and a friend of mine's like, oh, you need to watch the documentary under our skin. Now, I actually don't recommend anybody who's been newly diagnosed. <laughs> I don't want to watch that like, one. I like, don't want to watch it. No, it was uh it felt like a death sentence. Like I it felt so hopeless. I got off there, me, my ex-husband, and my kid just bawled because I thought I was a dead person. You know, and I was only 34. My kid was nine. Um, they've made so many other amazing documentaries since then that are have a little bit more hope infused in them. Yeah. And, and even Under Our Skin has a second part to it that was a little bit more hopeful. And so if you watch the first one, make sure you watch the second one right afterwards. Um, but like um, The Monster uh, Inside Me, that's a phenomenal one. Uh, the Quiet Epidemic was a really good one. Um, but they both, <laughs> they're not as just like doomsday as, as that, those first ones were. Right. Uh, so yeah. So, you know, here I, I, you know, roller coaster, right. I got my diagnosis. Oh shit. I'm a dead person, you know, and, and where do I turn? And there was so much conflicting information. And so I'm going the Western med route, the, the office that, uh, diagnosed me, um, a P, uh, she was a PA, but she had a, a doctor that worked in there and they're a famous Lyme place in Colorado. And it's funny. I run into him every now and then. I don't, I, sometimes I don't know whether I want to punch him or hug him <laughs> because he did the typical things that Western medicine do, right? He threw napalm at my body who'd been sick for decades. Not once did he ask me if I was pooping every day, which newsflash, I wasn't right. I was born constipated. That still hadn't gotten any better. He didn't ask what my stress level was like, didn't ask what my diet was like, didn't ask if I was, you know, sleeping well at night and instead went to war with this body that's been sick for decades. So for the first time in my life, I actually did feel like I was going to die. 
So that's the part where I feel like I want to punch him. The part where I feel like I want to hug him is it actually helped turn me towards functional medicine. And that's when I became a practitioner. So uh, FDNP is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. So I can take functional lab work and get to the root causes of people's uh, malfunctions. And since then, I've also become a somatic experiencing work and emotion code, you know, advanced genetics, mold, all the things that typically come along with Lyme, because I said, it's never just Lyme. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And um, I, like to think that your body was sick for so long and here you are now, like how, how do you feel now for the most part? Are you, do you I'm almost you 46 and I feel freaking amazing. Like my energy, it's funny. I've been to this last couple months was nuts. So like in two months time, I went to two funerals in Arizona, a business conference in Arizona, a business conference in La- in Connecticut and a business conference in Boulder. So it was just, and then Thanksgiving and it was just like, boom, 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 boom. And at each one of those health conferences, everybody, when I would tell my story and they'd look at me and they're like, you're just so vibrant now. Like I wouldn't guess that. And I'm like, yeah, I, I never knew that life could actually be this way. Like my brain works, my body works. I have energy all day. I have a libido, you know, I, my body doesn't hurt. Like, so even though I'm 46 and it's weird to see your body change, you know, like there's a couple parts of me that have, you know, gone south and my face is starting to change a little bit, but it's, uh, but other than that, like, I wouldn't know that I was 46. Like I feel amazing. Yes. And I can, I can sense, like, I can sense that. And I feel that in you and that you're very solid and whole in your energy. Um, and that's really amazing. Cause again, this is really what I want people to understand. You can be super duper sick and come back from pretty much everything. It's just figuring out what your body actually needs to get there. And so working with people like you who are able to help suss out a root cause is so beneficial. And that's, I'm in a similar path, right? With Ayurveda and just learning, just talking to people like, what are you eating? What are you doing with your body? Where are you living? What's your stress level? Basic, what I think common sense questions should be asked of people and and especially seeking medical help. But when I talk with people, my own clients, like doctors don't ask these questions. It blows my mind. And sometimes it even, they dismiss it and they're like, oh, diet really doesn't have anything to do with that. And it makes my head explode. I'm like, it has everything to do with that. And a lot of the stuff that I teach on, it's so frustrating because people dismiss it because it's not like the new latest and greatest, you know, double dapsone, blah, blah, blah protocol with rifampum and methylene blue. I love methylene blue, by the way, but (laughs) It, it's getting back down to the basics, because even if you do these cutting edge, you know, protocols, if you're still going to go to McDonald's and inflame your gut and inflame your brain, you know, everything else you're doing is not going to be able to work to its full potential. And you will relapse. If you do not get these foundations put into place, you will relapse. I, I'm speaking from personal experience, you know, as the good functional practitioner, I followed my diet. I took my supplements. I went to bed on time. I made sure I was hydrated. But one, I didn't address the mold. I didn't address the nervous system dysregulation. So that was like the last little piece I added. And then I kept relapsing and I kept relapsing. And then once I got all this stuff in play, and so a lot of people, it kills me halfway through the program, they're starting to feel really good. And they're like, when I can, when can I go back and eat blah, 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 blah. Or when can I go back and do blah, 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 blah. And again, here's my head exploding. It's like, you can't. Like that's part of what got you where you are. It's like having a diabetic reverse their diabetes and then asking when they can eat sugar again. Like you can, like that was the devil that caused that to begin with. You, We need to learn these new habits, these new lifestyles. And it's sad because it can feel so isolating because this world is not made for human health in any way, shape or form. Like it is jacked up. And so it, it can feel very isolating at times. And I, you know, it's a learning curve like anything else. You know, I, I've learned to plan, right? Because when you don't, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail, right? <laughs> so like, if I'm going to a holiday party, you know, I make sure I'm calling the hostess ahead of time, finding out what the menu is, seeing if there's anything that could be substituted. If not, I just bring my own damn meal because then that way I know I'm not starving to death and then reaching for something that I know I'm not supposed to have. And then I pay for it for the next week. 
Yeah. You know, I, I like operating at this level and keeping this level. And so there's things that I continually do, you know, with my detox regimen, with my lifestyle, it's not something that you do just till you get better. And then you go back to your old lifestyle. I mean, you could, but you're going to end up having to repeat the whole process all over again. I agree wholeheartedly. And it's interesting. I, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking to myself, people really want to go back? Like, I guess. But for me, I think once I got out and the addiction to the sugar and fast food and whatever else was broken, like, I didn't want to go back. And maybe my body's just different that way. Like, I, I the, the, just the thought of that like greasy coat on my teeth from like (laughs) like, a lot of it's that comfortable familiarity, you know, a lot of reasons why people will stay in an abusive relationship because that's what they were brought up with. That's what they know. You know, if, if fried chicken in a bucket was how their parents showed them love. And then we take that away. Of course I can see where they're, that dopamine is lacking and they're looking for that hit. They're looking for that connection again. Cause like I said, it can feel very isolated especially when I take somebody's life, I kind of dump it upside down and it really sucks when they're in a relationship or around family that aren't supportive. Right. And they just want to belong. And so, you know, I think logical mind, you know, is one thing and then just their soul of wanting to belong and wanting some comfort. Um, a lot of times rules out, right? Sure. And that makes that whole peer pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it is tough, like having lived it and changed my entire being and diet and I call it nutritional intake plan by now. I don't even like the word diet. Um, but it's like, I've had family members that are like, how do you do that? Or like, why are you doing that? Or, you know, it's like, like I kind of have to, and, but I've come to the conclusion that it's actually a choice. I'm making a choice to do it because I feel better and I find a lot of value in it, but it is sometimes uncomfortable or like I show up with a cooler. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm <laughs> the bag woman. Or stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you should see me when I travel to these health conferences. I've got my own water filter. I've got my own air filter. I've got my own <laughs> supplements. Like I really do try to substitute. I bring my EMF rocks that help, you know, <laughs> mitigate EMFs because I can't turn the Wi-Fi off in these rooms. It's I have to check a bag now every time I fly, even if it's for a two day freaking trip. Oh, Oh, man. And I would rather pay that $65, right? And and know that I'm going to be safe. And it's worth it to me. It's worth it to me because the first couple um, conferences I went to, Arizona was the worst for mold. Because if you think about it, at first you're like, it's a desert. They're running their freaking AC 24 seven, right? Which leaks and causes problems. Like anytime we get into an environment, which really wasn't meant for human life, right? And we have to tweak it so much for us to be there. We can, we cause problems. So the first couple hotel rooms I was in was wicked moldy. And I gained like 10 pounds in four days. Oh my God. My brain was all foggy. Like I was like, I took 10 steps back and thank God I know enough that it only took me a couple of weeks to under, undo it. But now I, I travel with an air filter. Like I'm, I'm, I'm done messing around because a lot of times I found that I just couldn't help it. It was like one room after another room, after another room of like crap. I don't want to be like the bubble girl. Right. <laughs> so I just do these other things that help take that burden off my body. So then, then my body can have a burden, you know, from the, these other areas that I have no control over. Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> If it's any consolation, you're not the only bubble girl out there. So oh my gosh, bubble girls unite. <laughs> yeah, we can start our own club. Seriously, because that's what it almost feels like you come down to. It's like, I'm not drinking that water. I'm not eating that food. I don't want to breathe that air. Like I can hardly even sometimes when I'm outside walking, like a car exhaust or whatever, I'm like dragging my dog because I'm like, I can't breathe the the dryer. That's just going to say the dryer stuff. Those, those, when I walk by those houses, I'm like, whoa. That's it's how I, I want to knock on the door and be like, stop poisoning yourself and your kids and your fur babies. Right. Cause animals oh. are really sensitive to that stuff too. And they're having so many more issues that people don't realize. And a lot of times people will take care of their fur babies before themselves. So a lot of times they could be a good gateway into teaching a person better habits, like throwing away those glade scented plugins, which are just absolute toxic endocrine disrupting bullshit. Yes. Yes. And it's like, 
I, people just, I don't think they get it. And uh, I had a friend, uh, we don't really speak any longer, unfortunately. Um, she had breast cancer and I could smell the scented candle on her outside. Like we were outside walking our dogs and I could smell it coming off her. And I was like, uh, and then she got offended that I told her that she smelled. And I was like, I'm not, I, no, you're missing the point. I'm <laughs> trying to let you know that being inside your house, if I can smell it like this on you outside, like that's so not good for you on the inside. Like, and you have all this other stuff, you know, but like I offended her. And so again, we don't talk anymore, but um, it's okay. I planted the seed hopefully, but it is sad because there's so many other healthier alternatives that I think people just don't really appreciate what those small things do for us over time. Um, Cause I, I think like, how do we undo things slowly over time, but how do we get there slowly yes. over time? And so these small things they are like, Oh, that doesn't really impact me, but it does. Right. And even like your story is a very good example of all the, the, the trauma, um, the different constipation issues, like all the things that were little things that sort of then culminated and turned into a, a very big problem. Um, well, I've been saying this for years is no matter we have normalized crap. We shouldn't be normalizing, mm -hmm. right? With these silly ass commercials of, do you have heartburn, indigestion, diarrhea? You know, we're singing about it <laughs> and there's an over a counter <laughs> remedy, but really that's a freaking, no matter how common a symptom may be is never normal. It is always your body's check engine light coming on saying, Hey dummy, there's something going on in here. And all too often, then we take that over the counter thing, which is like putting a piece of tape over the check engine light. And then we wonder why three years, five years later, we have an autoimmune disease. Yes. Why we have mental health issues. Why now we can't get our penis up. You know, you fill in the blank, but there's, like I said, all these things that we've normalized and now we're normalizing like Alzheimer's and dementia. You know, there's so many people who are like, oh, you know, blah, 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 just getting older. <laughs> brain fart. No, brain. our brains are meant to be resilient and last. We're not, that's not how we're supposed to go down, folks. Like we have to stop normalizing these illnesses. I agree. And I, I remember with um, Alzheimer's and uh, dementia that they were talking about heavy metals and how they just deposit into the brain and cut off your circuitry basically because they deposit in there and then it cuts down pathways. And um, it's like, well, well that's a little bit notorious. And everybody's Thanksgiving picture was showing all their food, you know, that was cooked in aluminum and in those aluminum containers, you know, that you like that you bring to parties with. And I thought my head was going to explode because there's there's ways around it. And it's and it's like you said, sometimes people get so overwhelmed. But I, I teach my folks, give yourself a year. Give yeah. yourself a year at making these little changes. You know, when you run out of your regular deodorant, switch to deodorant that's aluminum free. When you run out of your toxic toothpaste, switch to a toothpaste that's not toxic, you know, doesn't have fluoride. All these little steps add up over time and you'll be amazed at the end of the year and you look around and you're like, holy crap, my whole environment has changed. Yes. You know, so it's just taking that first little step. But yeah, aluminum, especially people with... um. With Lyme, you know, there was so much like 80% of Alzheimer's um, brains they found had Lyme disease, you know, and or then the the toxic heavy metals. And there's 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 ways around it. Like I said, that doesn't have to be your path. Yes, correct. And I, I will always chuckle because people are like, I don't eat metal. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it comes to you in so many ways that you're not aware of. Like you just talked about quite a few, you know, and they're like, oh, and it's like, yeah, so um, you just have to be learning a new way to be basically is what it comes down to. And it takes time. It's not something that is done overnight. So I think giving yourself at least a year is fair. And especially depending on where your starting point is um, coming from a place where you were like super duper sick for so long, that takes, I would imagine a bit more time and mm -hmm. learning and research. And it was quite the learning curve because I was a little miss ex hairstylist. Right. You talk about toxic, you know, all the crap that I put on myself, you know, all the different types of makeup and the body and the perfume and the scented everything and the scented hairspray. And then I'm working around all these chemicals and I'm getting my nails done and I'm, you know, lipstick, especially red is notorious for for lead, you know. Um, so 
I had all the scented candles. I had the plugins. I had the little Christmas tree, you know, fragrance thingy in my car, you know, used for breeze. Like I was the person with all doing all the things wrong. And so for me to unwind that, especially with around a family who just thought I was being a hypochondriac, you know, who didn't get it. And I was even that person, you know, back in the day, I was like freaking hippies, every, you know, who keep telling you that everything's going to give you cancer. And now I'm here on the other side going, everything's going to give you cancer. <laughs> and it's not like to be a do- Debbie doomsday, but it's the truth. We've put crap out there that is not meant for human consumption. And we wonder why our bodies are, are retaliating. So it's just, um, yeah, it's just fascinating. But if someone like me, you know, who was, I didn't have a background in health, until I became a practitioner, you know, can do these kind of changes and and have this kind of lifestyle. Anybody can, you know, I've gone through three bankruptcies on my way to getting better. And I, that's another thing that a lot of people will let that be a barrier to health. And it's so frustrating. I had a client who needed a few different treatments. And if she could have just gotten over that, I'm going to go into bankruptcy mindset and done it Right. After my last bankruptcy, I got, I had my credit score back to 700 within four months. Wow. Right. There are ways to rebuild this stuff. And thank God we live in a country where that's actually an option. Yeah. Right. So it frustrates me when people let money become the barrier to what gets them healthy. Because like I said, from somebody who's actually filed bankruptcy three times, and I wouldn't change a damn thing because each time was because of some different treatment or product that I needed to help, you know, detox my health or my, you know, an air filter or a water filter, or, you know, something along those lines, you know, now I have my health and I have my credit. So, woo. yes, yes, yes. And I mean, I, I also changed jobs and did some things to figure out financial ways to make it work. Um, and it's unfortunate that it has to come down to that. But as you're pointing out, like some, I don't want to put pressure on people or whatever. And I, I think, I think really maybe what it comes down to is like, once you're committed to healing, like it doesn't really matter. The cost is what it is. You'll figure it out. God will provide a way for you to make things happen if that's what your body really needs for you to heal. Absolutely. Um, and so don't be afraid of that as a, a possibility. Like I had a lot of debt myself too. And I, I figured out I paid it back. I've got it done now. And it it sucked, you know. Um, but I was grateful that God gave me the availability to borrow money to help myself because I didn't have another way to do it at that time. Absolutely. Um, so, but it is, it is a reality sometimes too, in that people, you know, it's, it's hard when you don't have enough, when you're feeling like you don't have enough to spend, but you have to prioritize yourself and spend on yourself. And then the rest kind of comes sort of like tithing with, with the Bible, right? Like we give before we really take care of ourselves kind of a thing. Um, you will always have enough. And it will always kind of find a way to work. Well, and we had talked off camera before this started about some of the gifts of Lyme. And that's that's part of what it teaches you is because I think especially women, that's part of the reason why Lyme affects women more than men and autoimmune diseases more women than men. And I think it's because we've put we've been taught right everybody else's needs before our own everybody else's needs before our own and look where it gets us tired, burnt out, sick, overweight, you know, and it's, it taught me to put myself first, right? All those silly cliches, you got to put your own oxygen mask on first. You can't pour from an empty cup. You know, there's so many of them because we have to say it 110 different times before people actually get it. Like wake up, you have to put yourself, but that's selfish, Heather. No, I'm not saying that if you've got a piece of food that, you know, you let your kids starve, you know, type of thing, like there's a common sense to it, but you really, you really do. You have to prioritize your finances You have to prioritize your time because, you know, I'm trying to teach this to my kid right now and he's not getting it either. And it's so frustrating because it's like, he's so worried about, well, I've got to put food on the table and I got to feed the cats and I got to do that. I got to do this. And I'm like, there is no cats if there is no you, right? Like there is no girlfriend if there is no you, like you have to prioritize yourself first. So it's like, it's like the one thing that anybody hears from this, you know, that's the the number one thing. And that's, like I said, one of the biggest gifts that I learned from this disease was how to prioritize myself first. 
Yeah. And that's a huge one, um, which I don't know how willing people are to swallow that pill sometimes, but it's not like you have to, you absolutely have to make yourself the priority because you're never going to get better if you don't like, and if you are not prioritizing yourself again, you have nothing left to give over. Like it's, it's an interesting equation that we have to somehow change the way that we view that and put ourselves first. And as women in particular, it is very challenging to do. Um, but I think it's important for people like us to share that and help people to hear those words because it is probably one of the most important lessons out of this um, experience. Do you, can you talk a little bit more, um, like you touched on it, but is there any kind of specific details you could share about what's helped you heal? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of it, it was focusing on the foundations of health. And so in FDN, that's what they teach is they have a dress for success model, which is diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction, and supplementation. And so, you know, again, dialing that in, it's amazing then how little treatment a lot of people have to do after they get that figured out because our body, we have coexisted with this bacteria for thousands of years. They found it in an Italian uh, mummy in the Alps, you know, three, 4,000 years ago in his system, you know, so we have, I think we've done some things to the virus, you know, or the bacteria over the past 20, 30, 40 years that have made it a little bit more virulent. And then our lifestyle has made us more sick. So it's been this, you know, inverse, you know, relationship, but our bodies know how to heal. Our bodies know how to do what it needs to do once we give it the tools and we take away the burdens off the body. And so focusing on the foundations as number one, like don't pass go, don't collect $200. And it's so frustrating because I'll be doing these talks. And then afterwards we're like, well, what did you do to treat? And I'm like, no, we're not even talking about treatment because Focus on the foundations first. And then there's a lot, of, obviously, like I said, Dr. Horowitz has got his double DAP zone. You've got methylene blue. You've got Dr. Rawls and Dr. Hinchy with their herbs. I love herbs. Love Dr. Rawls's protocol. You know, there's, there's a lot of different stuff out there. IV, you know, silver, you know, hyperbaric, like it just depends. And everybody's different. Everybody's not going to respond to the same treatment the same way another person does. Um, but with me, like I said, I didn't have to do, you know, and I did try a lot that I was on antibiotics for a couple of months and back when I thought they were trying to kill me. And then I did the herbal route and then I've done IV silver and I've done some controversial shit because that's what Lyme people do because we didn't have a whole lot of options. So I've done like MMS, you know, which is, you know, chlorine dioxide. I've done ozone. Um, uh, I really love energy work, frequency stuff. Um, you know, Rife, Royal Rife was was tackling a lot of these issues back in the 1930s. And we are electromagnetic beings, you know. So, you know, like right now I've got a, a little machine on that's delivering frequencies through a red light. Oh. You know, so, I, you know, there's a lot of different ways, but it's it's really peeling back the layer. And trauma, trauma work was probably one of the most biggest ones because coming from that early childhood trauma and then having the chronic disease and the heavy metals and the viruses and the bacteria, my nervous system was always in fight or flight. There was always a tiger chasing me. Right. And you can never truly heal when you're in that space. And so the last three years I've been focusing mostly on mindset and nervous system um, resetting. And that's been, that's been uh, a godsend. Like I can't get over how simplistic yet powerful a lot of those tools are. Um, on that, by chance, if anybody's interested, do you have like a simple exercise people could do to sort of help if they're having a particularly anxious day or particularly stressful day, something they could do quickly to help just to regulate themselves? Yes, absolutely. So I learned this one from Dr. Amy Apigian. She does the biology of trauma summit and it's called a VU with a push away. And so when we combine these two things, so a VU is just like it sounds, it's, just, it's the word VU and we kind of sing it out. That helps stimulate the vagus nerve, which um, helps calm your system down. And then the push away, a lot of the folks that have been, especially women who have been chronically sick or have a tendency to be a little on the empathic side, you know, compassionate side. So for me, I always had a tendency to have everybody's crap was always just right here on me. And so the push away helps 
energetically push out a bubble for just me and my energy. And so you'll put your arms up next to your shoulders and you're going to make them nice and taut and you're going to really act like you're pushing a very large boulder away. You're going to go slow. So take a deep breath in and at the same time, we're going to go voo as we push out very slowly. So take a deep breath in and then we push out. Voo and go slow. Voo. The slower, the better. It's such a hard boulder. Push, 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 push. And then you can also like do that to the top. You can do it to the side. You can do it to the bottom. But even just that one time, it's amazing. I don't realize how excitable I get when I'm doing these types of things. But then every time I do that, like immediately I felt my system just. Oh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's easy, right? That literally took like 15 seconds. Yes. Um, yes. You know, and I typically try to have people do it, not when they're in crisis, because you won't remember. So it's good to start bef- while you're not in crisis. And I usually have people do that before they eat, because if we're in fight and flight, right, if, if we're not in rest and digest, so many people have digestive issues because we're stuck in that fight or flight. So if you can get yourself out of fight or flight before you eat, like your digestion and everything's going to work so much better. So practicing that, like doing it a couple times a day before each meal, such a game changer. Huh. That's awesome. Thanks. I've never heard that one before. And uh, it, I do know, obviously, though, about flight or fight or flight and just how so many people struggle with digestion. And if we just slowed down and had more mindful attention to eating versus shoveling food in our face as fast as possible, hurry, let's still stare at our computer, our phone's ringing and whatever else is still happening at the same time. Like, yes, well, when we wonder why we have some challenges. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so that's very helpful. Um, and then uh, can you say, were there like specific healing moments that you can remember? Or were there times that you knew I'm definitely going to get better? You know, because even after I got my diagnosis, you know, the healing came in so many different layers over about a seven year period of time. Like I said, with the last one being the trauma stuff over the last couple of years. I mean, I remember like when I became an FDN and three months after into the program, like I was operating at like 80% better. It was incredible. And that last 20% was because I was living in a moldy house and I had cavitations And so I kept hitting that wall and then it was those things I had to overcome and then I would level up and then I'd find something else that I'd have to do and then I would level up and level up and level up. And so I've kept leveling up. The only thing left for me to level up now really is my weight. I've gained about 30 pounds this last year because I almost went through a divorce and then I was in these moldy hotels and then the holidays and I've just... 46. So it's not coming off as easy as it used to. And I have a desk job and I'm not getting as much steps in. And so that's like the last little piece that I have to level up is to lose some of this weight. But for the most part, as far as like focus and brain and energy and stamina and all of it goes, like I've, I really dialed in quite a bit. Yeah. And I'm curious too, how does your family feel now? Mm -hmm. I know you had sort of touched on the fact that they weren't like super supportive then just seeing the transformation in you, how's has that had any impact on them? I don't speak to them actually. Oh, um, all right. <laughs> my mom is ridiculously toxic and a bully. And I was about five years ago. She said some really horrific things as, you know, as I'm learning to love myself. And I was like, I'm not, I don't allow anybody to talk to me like this, let alone my mother. Like if you can't be nice, then we can't be in relationship and she couldn't be nice. Um, same with my father. My sisters kind of followed suit with my mother. So I, yeah, I don't really talk to my family. Uh, and even when I was talking to them and getting better, they still didn't, they still didn't see it and they still weren't really believing me. So like when I would like offer up some ideas on when they would get sick or some of the stuff they were doing, I, they would still dismiss me. So they absolutely mm-hmm. couldn't see, see or validate me. And so that's one thing that you have to really get over in this journey is, is the expectations on others. You know, if, if that's why you're doing this is to get validation and be seen by others, like you can't, because even though I've made such a miraculous turnaround and you would think sometimes the ones that are closest to you actually can't see it and they can't show up for you the way that you would hope that they would. So I've had to let go of a lot of expectations and how people show up and just really make sure to, again, kind of focusing on my side of the street, 
you know, and it was lonely for a couple of years there because you had talked about letting go of a friend, you know, and I had done, you know, cleaning house on like that myself. And I went like two years where there was a vacuum where I cut people out, but new people hadn't quite come in. And I questioned a lot of what I was doing and wondering if it was the right thing to do because I was so freaking lonely at that time, but I stuck with it. And then now I am surrounded by the most amazing, supportive, beautiful people in the whole wide world. Like I can't even get over my community that I have built, you know, but it took, it took some time and it took some sacrifice almost like anything else. Right. I had to say no to what I didn't want in my life. And then I had to really have faith and keep with the yes, just like anything. I think the universe constantly tempting us sometimes. And you have to, the no sometimes is even more powerful than the yes. Yes, very much so. And I think that's also a lot of this lesson is like learning to say no and not giving again, back to making yourself the priority, but like having boundaries with yourself, not giving all of yourself and having some left over for you to be able to take care of yourself and do what you need to do. Um, That's just like very inspiring, very beautiful because you're not the first person I've had on here that has talked about having to cut out some toxic family members. And it's not exactly the most pleasant topic or thought that you're like, I'm going to no longer talk to my mom. Um, but sometimes it's what needs to happen for you to be able to heal and they can only compound your situation if you're not able to get yourself away from them versus being strong enough to get yourself away. And sometimes it is just those actions that we take to support ourselves that will then have the ripple effect that the universe knows to support us too. And it's when the greatest changes can happen, but it is sometimes the hardest or the scariest moments that we've got to take that leap of faith or jump or know that this truly is our, our path. And this is where we belong. No matter what anybody says, we're at peace and, and we feel good with ourselves at night. You know, I can put my head on the pillow and be comfortable with who I am in my own skin. Absolutely. And that's worth its weight in gold. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I've forgiven and I've, I've worked through all my stuff and I've forgiven them, you know, and if they were to ever to come back and apologize and want something different, I would be open to that. I don't ever see that happening, but you know, and I'm not saying that it doesn't ever bother me, especially around the holidays. Like it absolutely will knock me to my knees in tears and I let myself feel it and I don't live there and I move on. You know, I let myself have those feelings. It sucks that my own freaking parents can't see and love me for the amazing fucking person that I am. And I have enough love. I have enough faith, right? God loves me enough that that's, that's really all I need. I don't need to be filled up from any other outside sources. This I've got what I need. So that's one of the biggest lessons I've had to learn as well. Yes. And it's a very beautiful one, but it's a hard one sometimes yep. to get. And Absolutely. Um, it's kind of crazy to think how sick you had to get to get to feel that lesson. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? But it's like I, I, almost I think to the, sometimes it's like, well, I'm glad I got that sick. So I got so many serious lessons out of it. But I don't know, maybe you just get a little sick and still get a lot of those lessons out of it, too. But I wouldn't wish this on my own worst enemy. But I am glad that you have the similar experience that there are some really good things that can come out of it. Um, despite a lot of the hard parts. Um, and I think maybe that could be my, my final question for you today is what is the best thing that's happened to you as a result of this? And I know you had talked a little bit about some of the good stuff that's happened to you, but, um, if you could summarize it in in one thought and it doesn't even have to be one thing, like what, I guess is the best thing that has happened to you. It's taught me, um, some tenacity and to never give up. Um, because right now, so it was funny. I've, so I started a business three years ago. I swear to God, I feel like this business is the hardest thing I've ever done. And it's, you know, going through Lyme and, and all that other stuff, it's taught me, you know, this, the stick to itness, you know, not giving up. There were so many days in the beginning where I kept putting stuff out there, kept putting stuff out there. It's, it's, it's hard to be that vulnerable, especially on social media, putting stuff out there for years and feeling like crickets, right? Not hearing anything. Now I'm coming into my third year and I'm starting to get some traction. My podcast uh, had a 999% increase 
this year. Yeah. Over last year, you know, I'm being heard in 17 different countries, you know? So it's uh, just not giving up because you can't, because it's, you know, it's sad. And I, I hear this all the time too. Well, I've already been to 30 practitioners. Well, that 31st one might be the one that has the answers, right? Like you right. It's like those you hear of those those gold miners, right? That would just give up like six inches away from the pain. <laughs> like you can't, you can't, you just can't give up. I don't care. Same thing with dating. Like it's all the same thing. I had so many people. Well, I've been to you know, I've had so many dates. Blah blah blah. I was on hundreds. I dated hundreds of men. Was married once before before I met the husband I have now you know, and he is the biggest blessing in my life. And I thank God every day for him. But if I would have just given up and been like, eh, they're all men, you know, they're all assholes and they all want one thing. You know, if I would have kept with that same story, I had a, I had a person who did a discovery call with me and she was so crusty and bitter about how other practitioners have treated her and gaslighted her. And I get it, but it was like a person who brings all that baggage from all your ex-boyfriends into the new relationship. Do you think that it's going to work? No, you got to show up each new situation, brand freaking new and hope that this is going to be it. And And even the ones that didn't work out, there was some lessons in there for you to learn. I can guarantee you, you got something from it if you actually sat down and thought about it. You know, we're not all just, I hope that you're not just, you know, bumping through life, not learning from things, but um, I stick to it. And and like I said, not giving up because like I said, so you've seen 30 practitioners, it might be that 31st one that helped you put all the pieces together and boom, you're off to the races. Yes. Yes. And I, I've thought about that many times. And as I, you were talking about, I'm thinking about like a scavenger hunt or a deck of cards, right? And like they're scattered throughout the universe. You don't really know where they are. So you've got to go and find them and you can't give up. You've just got to keep knocking and talking to the people behind the door and see, do they have the card that you need to finish your hand so that you can go on to the next level. If anything, Um, you learn what doesn't work. So you have 30 things that you now know doesn't work. Like it's a process of elimination. God bless it. I know 30 things that don't work. Thanks, Heather. So now I've got uh, another, I don't even want to know what number um, (laughs) that didn't work. And uh, on to the next, as my dad says, another broken heart and moving on. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of funny that you weave that in there for me and maybe just to hear those words today. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <Absolutely>. But <laughs> um, I really appreciate you. And if somebody was interested to work with you as well, um, can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like? Like, do you have packages? Does that, how can someone find you? Uh, what it, I hear you in like what I think you're specializing in, but like, Do you work just with blind people? Do you work with all kinds of people? Just if you could talk a little bit more about that, please. I work with all kinds, you know, autoimmune, mental health, weight, you know, everything that I've been through. It's pretty much what I, what I work with, Um, but do have a specialty in Lyme and mold. Um, I'm the Lyme boss, L-Y-M-E, you know, across all platforms. And then if you you know, want to set, you know, go to my website, the Lyme and there's a way to schedule a low cost 15 minute consultation. Cause I don't give out free consultations anymore because I actually found out that whole energetic exchange and people don't value. I have found a lot of times things that are free. I was giving my whole foundations of health course away for free. Must have given it away to a hundred different people signed up for it. Do you know how many people actually watched the videos and went through with it? None. None. So I started at, you know, it's not, it's not a large, but it's, it's, it's an energetic skin in the game. I only want to work with people who actually want to get better, not somebody who wants to keep the victim mentality and, oh yeah, you're sick and you've been sick. Like, uh -uh, I'm not your person for that. If you want to get better, then set up a free low cost, 15 minute consultation. And then, you know, it starts off with intake forms. I actually don't do a whole lot of lab testing anymore because I found that these intake forms that are ridiculously extensive to be really, really um, on point on kind of what's going on with a person. And it just depends on where they're at in their healing journey. But yeah, I have some small packages that include some tools and some supplements and I do emotion code work and some energy work as well as, you know, teach you the foundations of health. And so it really is looking at all aspects of what it takes to heal. And 
I just started with a new guy a couple weeks ago and I'm still just shocked at how quickly people turn around in a short period of time when they actually put these things into place. It's just, I've been doing this for years and it still never ceases just to blow me away at how quickly our bodies can turn around when we give it the tools that it needs. And it usually starts with diet. Yes. And it's beautiful. Like I'm just starting to see people and it's so beautiful when they come and they're like, Oh my God, I've been pooping or, Uh Oh my God, I feel so much better. I sleep through the night. I don't have acid reflux. Or It's like, wow. You know, it's only been 30 days since you were here to see me last. Like, that's great. And it is just, it's, it's awesome. And I'm glad that you have empowered yourself with the knowledge to have a fixed yourself, but B to be of a resource to other people, because um, it's really valuable to have a placeholder like yourself for people, an accountability coach, somebody to check into somebody who's done the work themselves that can guide others on their journey. I, I was starved for people like you when I was healing myself. And even now, you know, I still use people like you to continue on my, my process and journey of constantly evolving. Absolutely. We weren't meant to do this alone, you know, and I think that's where a lot of people get into problems too. And it's like, no, 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 no. You know, even I have a coach, even I have a business mentor, you know, I, I, I'm not doing any of this by myself. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to, I tried and I got really sick. (laughs) (laughs) I know what happens when you try to take on the weight of the world by yourself and you don't talk and you're too proud and you don't speak up and yeah, it leads to all kinds of dysfunction and problems. So (laughs) thank you for being here. And again, for sharing your story, being vulnerable and just being such a, a beautiful presence and good solid energy again, for people to see and to hear and to, to know, right. I think it comes down to like, just true, ultimate, radical belief that you can heal your proof. I'm proof. There's a lot of proof out there, which is what we, how we look at it and where we choose to look. And I'm preferring to look at proof that you can get better versus proof that you can stay sick. Cause there's a lot of people that can prove that too. Um, but there are reasons for that. And I, I hate to be that like insensitive about it for people, but it really does, I think, come down to some serious spiritual level decisions that we have to make consciously and subconsciously through our whole being um, if we really want to have radical remission and healing. And And I get an amen. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So thank you again. And I really hope you have a wonderful afternoon. I look forward to sharing this episode and uh, sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care. Bye.